first of all, yeah, thanks for, for the great organization of this conference. So I'm going to talk about um, a project that, of course, wouldn't be possible without Dirk. So um, probably, I hope you can see it, but um, this is a picture of the group a couple of years ago, of Dirk's group. So I was in the middle of my PhD back then. And uh, I mean, I, I cannot really point at them at the moment, but you probably can recognize Dirk there on the right and uh, a couple of other faces. And um, yeah, it was a great time. And um, Dirk was a great supervisor. And uh, he, I mean, already like uh, Bob Del Boro um, wrote in his letter, he really implemented these ideas of letting everybody develop their own scientific style and um, develop themselves individually in the scope of this group in Berlin. And so it made a very colorful picture, just like uh, this picture there in the summer of 1915, I think, uh, of 2015. And a couple of months afterwards, um, uh, Dirk, he introduced me to Karen, Karen Folkman. And um, there she first introduced me to this problem that I'm going to talk to, about today. Uh, but um, it turned out to take quite a while um, since, uh, until I realized then that the tools that I'm going to, or that I was going to develop in my PhD were actually capable of solving this problem. And um, yes, so, so this is the story that I'm going to talk about, um, connected to this Euler characteristic of out of N. And uh, naturally, this wouldn't be possible with, uh, without Dirk because he made this connection, but also because it's connected to the work of Dirk via this Hopf algebra of graphs that plays an important part in this path to this proof of this problem. All right, so I'm going to um, introduce this problem or try to introduce this in a very like uh, pedagogical way. And um, yeah, so if you don't know anything about OutFN or outer space, um, you should also sort of at least understand something about it. So I will be very slow. And um, if you don't understand something, please just unmute yourself and ask a question or put it in the chat. I, I don't know if I can see it here with the chat, but probably someone else can just um, can just ask the question then instead. So this is about groups, and um, especially it's about automorphisms of groups. So there's a second order group, so to say. Um, so we take all the automorphisms of a given group. An automorphism of a group is just a map from the group to itself, an isomorphism, which respects the group property. So it's pretty basic. And um, for every group, this group of automorphisms has a, has a normal subgroup, namely the inner automorphisms, which are sort of the boring automorphisms of the group. And these automorphisms are just given by, um, by uh, uh, conjugation of elements in the original group. And the group of outer automorphism is now the quotient of the group of inner automorphisms. Um, or is this now the, the quotient group where these inner, automor inner automorphisms are quotient out. And so, um, yeah, and sorry, I forgot to tell you that um, if this is too basic for you, um, please wait until the end of the talk. There's going to be some new results that I didn't present before. So also if you have heard this talk by me before, which could be uh, at some occasion, then bear with me in the end of the talk, I will give some, some new results that are very fresh. All right, so um, we have this outer automorphism group of a group and we want to um, apply it to a specific group, namely the free group. And the free group is something you also very know, uh, you, you also probably very well know. So it's uh, just the group with N generators that can be thought of uh, some letters that you can just multiply by writing them in a string. And there's one identity that just says that the inverse of some letter times the letter itself is nothing. And um, therefore you can just form a group by multiplication of two um, elements and you can also form inverses 
So it's sort of the simplest groups, a group uh, you can imagine in a sense. And um, this automorphism group of this free group is our main object of interest in this talk. This object is also something very concrete. So you can write down some generators. I think Karen even actually wrote them down on Wednesday in her talk. Um, so for instance, you can take as generators um, the, the um, isomorphism of the group where you just replace like, the first letter by a product of two letters. And another generator of the auto automorphism group is replacing a letter by its inverse. And you um, may permute the letters non-trivially. So this is sort of a generating set for this auto n group. Um, another example of an auto automorphism group is the mapping class group, which um, is the group of homomorphisms of a closed connected orientable surface of genus G. And um, you can think of this as the auto automorphism group of the fundamental group of the respective surface. I mean, you also probably know this, um, this kind of, these kind of objects where you think of the symmetries of some surface, but you can think of this also as automorphisms of the fundamental group of the surface. At least for surfaces, this works. An example is um, this group of homomorphisms of the torus, um, which is of course very important. It's a modular group essentially. Um, and uh, it has two generators, so you can cut the torus in two kinds of ways. They are indicated here in the as red and blue circles that you can hopefully see. And you can cut the, the torus along these lines and then turn it by 360 degrees, and then glue it back together and you get a generating set for your, for your mapping class group of the torus. And yeah, you can identify this with um, SL2Z. Um, right. So part two, so now I've spoke on groups. So now why spaces? And the reason to talk about spaces is, of course, a very basic philosophy that you probably also all know, that um, the, the, this question, how do you study such objects, such groups as the mapping class groups or out of N, can be answered. Um, and for physicists, this is probably more intuitive even than for mathematicians, that to study sort of a group, it's always best to realize the group as some set of symmetries of some concrete object. And uh, this is the philosophy. So we want to study these groups by inventing some object which um, is symmetric under the, an action of this group. So the idea is to realize the group as, um, as symmetries of some geometric object. And this, in this case, so the group would be either out of N or the mapping class group. And of course, this is an idea that has been developed by many people. Um, for the mapping class group, this construction works via the Teichmüller space. So for, for a Teichmüller space, what you need for as a data is um, some closed connected and orientable surface S. And um, you make a space from this data by um, taking the space of where each point is a Riemann surface X. And um, at each point, you also have a marking. And this marking is just a homomorphism from the surface, which is given as data, to the Riemann surface. So you can see in this picture that, so, so you have to imagine like this, this big space, each point is a marking and uh, a pair of a Riemann surface and this marking, which identifies the surface with the Riemann surface. So an, an alternative way to think about this is just to think about um, each point to give some kind of metric on the surface but you can also think about it as a marking, just a homomorphism. Okay, now um, the mapping, mapping class group is a symmetry of the space just by, um, by composing with this marking. So um, you, can just, uh, you can just modify this ma mark marking by an homomorphism of the initial surface, which you started with, and so you permute the points in the space in some way. And this is this action of the mapping class group. And of course, this action would be interesting if it wouldn't have a bunch of very nice properties. But, um, so, but this is just the basic idea behind this construction. Um, for, for out of N, um, this 
this uh, approach is sort of mimicked. Um, and this uh, was invented by Markala and Karen in 86. Um, they sort of um, invented an analogous construction for out of n. And this construction is, um, replaces the surface, which you start with, or which is given as input data, with um, a very simple graph with the rows uh, with n petals. So it's just a, a self loop graph, which has n uh, self loops or n tadpoles. It's, it's a basic tadpole graph. And um, so in this case, say, uh, in this case, we have here R3, which is the rows with three petals. And then um, you construct a space from this by, um, by taking each point in the space to be a graph with the length assigned to each edge, just like in, in the talk um, by Francis on Wednesday. And um, at each point, you also have this, an additional data, which is a marking, which is in this case a homotopy from the rows to the respective graph. So the, the marking now gives a sort of a deformation um, or how you have to uh, give gives sort of the, the information how you have to deform the rows to get the, um, get the graph. And um, just as in the mapping class picture, out of n now acts on, um, on the space, which is therefore called outer space by composition with a marking. So um, there's, there's a tricky uh, point here that I'm sort of skimming a bit over that you have to identify your element of out of n with um, an element of the outer automorphism group of the fundamental group of the rows. But the fundamental group of the rows is just the free group, which is quite easy to see. So this works this way. All right. Um, um, okay. So um, this is a picture of outer space, just as an illustration by Karen 2008, an article by her. And you can see that it's made up of these graphs. And um, so there are different cells and um, in different cells, they can be the same graph. And in the different cells, the, these graphs, they only differ by the marking. So um, you can imagine now out of n permuting these cells, but always mapping like the graph in the, in the, on the same graph, but changes this marking out of n. And in the, in the boundaries, so in the, the smaller um, dimensional um, faces of this thing, there are um, then the graphs of one of the edges is contracted. Right, um, so you already heard about a couple of applications of outer space. So um, of course you can apply this to study the group out of N. Um, there's also applications to the modular space of um, punctured curves or tropical curves. You can use it to study some um, invariance of symplectic manifolds. And um, in Marco's talk, uh, you heard about applications in mathematical physics. And um, Francis talked about applications to uh, graph complexes. All right, um, so, so now we want to apply all this stuff that, um, that uh, I have been discussing now. And um, the application is, of course, we want to study some invariants of those groups. And um, what, what we want to do, we want to study the cohomology, of course, um, of uh, out of n, for instance, so that would be one in invariant that we want to study a topological invariant. And the trick is there that um, we can identify the cohomology of um, of this group with the respective object of the quotient of outer space with the group with the uh, with the group, and this uh, quotient is um, is this modular space of graphs. And this works because um, outer space is contractible, as uh, Karen and Markala showed. So one of the simplest invariants that one can imagine um, that one would like to study there is, of course, the Euler characteristic. And um, yeah, so we can study this Euler characteristic using this quotient. 
All right. Um, I, I briefly want to give a further motivation to look into this quotient, uh, to look into this Euler characteristic, I mean. Um, so, so why is this Euler characteristic especially interesting for the case of out of n? Uh, the reason for this is that there's a very natural map from the free group to the free abelian group. So Fn is uh, the free non-abelian group, of course, and Zn is the free abelian group. And this, um, this map, of course, just works by forgetting that the generators of, of the free group, they, um, they are non-commutative. So it just slashes them all together, and what you get is effectively an an element of the abelian group. And you can uh, derive from this homomorphism, you can just get a homomorphism of groups also uh, from out of n to the outer automorphism group of Zn. And um, the outer automorphism group of Zn is a very well-known group. It's just GLnZ. And um, now one is interested in, um, in the kernel of this map. So the the outer automorphisms of the free group, which, um, which uh, go into, into GLNZ are sort of the non-interesting or the commutative automorphisms of the free group. And one wants to study these inherently non-commutative automorphisms. And these um, are in this mysterious Torelli kernel here, which I call calligraphical TN on this left-hand side. And one can just make this into a um, little short exact sequence. And yeah, so like I said, this non-abelian part of out of n is now interesting. This is this Torelli kernel. And by this short exact sequence, um, one can relate the Euler characteristic of out of n with the product of, um, of GLNZ and this Torelli kernel, just by the vibration, vibration property of the, um, of the Euler characteristic. And so this um, Euler characteristic of out of n here on the left-hand side of this equation down there, it gives sort of a leverage to look into or to peek into this interesting kernel. Um, but um, there's something really interesting happening there, namely that the Euler characteristic of GLNZ is, is zero for all n larger than three. So um, with some with very basic arithmetic, you can see that there's something funny going on, uh, except for the case where the Euler characteristic of out of n vanishes. So if, if the, if the left-hand side also vanishes, this is all fine. And then it just means that the Torelli kernel Euler characteristic can be anything. But computations, they actually show that the Euler characteristic is not zero for most cases. And uh, one can actually prove or I mean, we actually proved eventually that it's not zero for any n larger than two. But um, from this, one can actually deduce information still on this kernel, namely that it has uh, one finitely generated homology for n larger than three, if this Euler characteristic of out of n is not zero. So um, this is interesting that one can leverage information on this Euler characteristic into this kernel and deduce that it has uh, non-finally generated homology. So the conjecture that John Smiley and Karen had in, um, in 97 is that um, the Euler characteristic does not vanish. And they also conjectured that the Euler characteristic grows exponentially or the magnitude grows exponentially for n to infinity and they and uh, they, um, they performed some initial computations of this Euler characteristic up to n to 11. And these computations, they were later strengthened by Zagier up to um, 100. But um, yeah, so the question so uh, was, of course, if one can prove this in general. Um, there's a related conjecture, a stronger conjecture due to Magnus, um, which states that this uh, Torelli kernel is not finitely presentable. And this um, says in topological terms that the second homology group of, um, of the Torelli kernel is infinitely generated, which of course also implies that um, the Torelli kernel is, is not finitely generated, uh, it does not have finitely generated homology. And um, also, uh, Best Wiener, Bax, and Margalit in 2007 proved that um, this Torelli kernel indeed 
does have uh, a non-finitely generated homology, but they didn't touch any of the um, other two conjectures up here by doing this. They used a different argument to actually show that it has non-finitely generated homology. So the upper two conjectures remained open. And um, yeah, so the result of Karen's and my work was now to, um, to make the, the uh, upper conjecture, the initial conjecture on the Euler characteristic into a theorem. So the result is that um, the Euler characteristic of out of n is not zero. And um, yeah, that could be the end of the talk, but I will explain some details in the rest of the talk um, on, on this result and um, give some, some further aspects and newer results too. So um, the theorem explicitly is that the Euler characteristic is always smaller than zero for n larger than two, and that, that, has, that it has a specific growth rate, which is given by the gamma function for n to infinity. And there's this weird log squared term here in the denom denominator, which I don't really know how to interpret, but um, this is how the asymptotics actually look like. Uh, so this settles the initial conjecture, but uh, there are a lot of immediate questions. For instance, the large growth rate of the Euler characteristic, it indicates that there's huge amounts of homology in odd dimensions of these groups. And um, nobody knows where this homology is coming from because there's only one odd dimensional class known in rank seven. And uh, this is due to a large um, computer calculation by Bartholdi in 2016. And the question is, of course, what generates all this, this um, homology? <clears throat> so I will talk a bit more about this later, but first of all, I will talk about how we obtained this theorem. So we proved this based on an implicit expression for, for these numbers, chi out of n. And this expression looks as follows. It's a bit complicated, but um, bear with me. So it's an asymptotic expansion of a function that you see there on the on the left hand side, this two pi i square root times e to the power of, of minus n times n to the power of n can be expanded up asymptotically for very large n in terms of the gamma function. And if you do this, you find that the coefficients they encode these numbers, um, this Euler characteristic of out of n. And this is what we proved. And one can deduce from this. Um, that uh, that these uh, one can use properties of these numbers from this theorem. So there's a there's an analytic argument to, which is quite complicated that um, uh, goes from from this asymptotic expansion expression or this implicit expression of these numbers to the uh, actual result that the um, Euler characteristic is always negative and the growth rate. But um, in the rest of the talk, I will mainly talk about um, how to prove this implicit equation here because it's connected to quantum field theory. And one can also use um, this uh, Hopf algebra of Dirk to actually uh, prove this, or it's used to prove this. So uh, just to put this a bit into perspective, uh, an analogy to the mapping class group um, or the analogous calculation of the mapping for the mapping class group um, was performed by Hara and Sergier. Um, and uh, in this case, um, things are much more beautiful in a sense because there you get an explicit uh, result for the, um, for the Euler characteristic. And they just found that um, the Euler characteristic of the modular space of curves of genus G or the mapping class group of a surface of genus G is given by the Bernoulli numbers. Um, divided by some fraction, uh, divided by some stuff. And um, yeah, the original proof of this fact was uh, due to Hara and Zagier, also in 86. But there's an, uh, there quickly came an alternative proof based on quantum field theory or topological field theory methods later by Penner. And this uh, proof was then eventually not, uh, still uh, simplified by Konsevich in 92 who also used topological field theory. And this simplified proof was sort of the blueprint for our proof of, um, of the Euler characteristic for chi out of n. And the only thing that we sort of added was this inverse philosophy 
that comes from the Hopf algebra approach um, of uh, Dirk uh, to quantum field theory. So how does this uh, proof by Konsevich of this Euler characteristic for the mapping class group work? So the first thing that Konsevich did was prove this identity, which relates on the left-hand side, the, the mapping class group or the Euler characteristic of the mapping class group with, um, with uh, a sum over graphs. So this is MGN. So you also seen this in this talk or, uh, in this conference already. So it's not the mapping, uh, the modular space of surfaces of genus G, but there's a generalization with, with n punctures, and you probably all know that. But um, you can, or the, the ingenious thing to do is to form sort of this weird linear combination of um, different numbers and package them together in this um, generating function with the strange 2 minus 2g minus n, n factor popping up there. And if you package it up this way, you can calculate the, this linear combination of numbers in terms of a, of a generating function that, um, or in terms of an expression, which every physicist immediately knows how to evaluate. So it's just a sum over connected graphs. And um, I have to add that, so, so, there's a, so you have to take all graphs which um, are connected and which have um, neither zero, one, and two valent vertices but zero, three or higher valent vertices are allowed. And for each um, graph, you take the parity of um, the number of vertices and you divide by the automorphism group of the, of the graph. And you take um, into account so that you mark the Euler characteristic of the graph, which is just the number of vertices minus the number of edges of the graph. And um, so the difficult part, of course, is to prove this identity. And uh, Konsevich proved this using a combinatorial model of MGN um, based on this model by Penner, but, um, which is uh, a model uh, from ribbon graphs. And you probably also know the story and how this works. So here's a little picture of this. So um, I unfortunately don't have a pointer, but um, let me see if we can do this. So on the left-hand side, you see this ribbon graph, gamma, and uh, you can convince yourself that it has one boundary component and it has Euler characteristic minus one. So um, from this data alone, it follows that you can embed this ribbon graph on the torus and uh, stretch out the ribbon graph such that there's only one point left on the torus. And um, so therefore, you get sort of a, um, a model of a surface of genus one with one marked point. And this gives you sort of the model for M11, for the mapping class group, genus one with one mark point uh, of a modular space. All right, so consider choose this model to prove this identity. And then um, the easy part for physicists, maybe for mathematicians, is a bit more complicated, is uh, to actually evaluate then the sum on the right hand side, which you do by a topological field theory argument. And if you do this, you see immediately that you get these negative zeta values there as a result in each order in that. And then um, sort of to recover the Harazagi formula for the mapping class group Euler characteristic, you just use a short exact sequence argument, uh, which relates uh, modular spaces with diff different numbers of punctures. So you can just forget one puncture in your, on your surface. And this is a nice map. So you can use it to relate the Euler characteristic of, of these um, spaces. So this is the proof of the Harazagi formula in sort of one slide um, due to Konsevich. It's pretty nice that it um, is so short in a way. And um, the proof of, um, of our results sort of works analogously. Um, the only thing that we added is this uh, is sort of this this renunciation argument. So to actually make this argument work, it's useful to, to take sort of an algebraic perspective just in the, in the philosoph philosophy of Dirk. So we take H to be a vector space, which is spanned by all kinds of graphs. And um, so all the graphs, they are connected and um, three valent or higher. And um, you can just 
now formally write these kind of objects, this, um, this linear combination here of, um, of the um, Euler characteristic of the modular space as sort of an evaluation on an infinite sum of graphs, which is sort of an element in the formal ring of power series on this vector space. And this map phi, it maps from, from this vector space to Q. So it associates to every graph just this, um, this alternating sign on the number of vertices, which you can see below. So, so this phi is very easy and uh, to handle via topological field theory. But um, if you look into the analogous picture on, uh, or for Artipan, you have sort of a similar um, you, have, you can write it down in a similar way, but um, this map that you need to evaluate on all graphs is uh, much more complicated. It's not just the, the sign on the, um, on the, on the, of the number of vertices of the graph, but a non-trivial sum. So here um, in, on the top, in the top, I, um, I wrote down this generating function of the Euler characteristic and you can also express this as sort of evaluation of such a character on this formal sum. I call this character tau. And this x is again this, the formal sum over all graphs. And this tau maps again from the vector space of graphs to q. And to each graph, we associate a sum over all forests of the graph. Um, over all, um, so a forest is just a subgraph with no cycles. And for each forest, we take now the alternating sum over, um, so we take this alternating sum over the forest where we take into account the number of edges in this forest. So this um, character or this, uh, this function on this, on this vector space is harder to evaluate, but um, the uh, Hopfaldebar comes to, to the rescue. So this is not directly approachable by a T with T, but, um, yeah, so, and also, so I forgot to mention how to actually prove this. So this was um, already proven by Smiley and, uh, and Karen, by John Smiley and Karen. And uh, you need this forest collapse construction, which, um, which is due to Mark Haller and Vogtmann to prove this, this kind of identity there. So um, to make progress there, one, one can, can employ this hop algebra to, uh, of graphs so we can um, we can take we can promote this this vector space to an algebra by just allowing for multiplication and just freely multiplying um, graphs. So we can we also have to take disconnected graphs into our vector space now, and uh, we can define a coproduct. Um, probably you all know this coproduct that um, takes a graph and maps it onto the formal sum of a tensor products of the graph times uh, the respective uh, tensor product of subgraphs. So there's a subgraph on the left hand side, and you contract the subgraph on the right hand side, and you specify which subset of subgraphs you allow. And in this case, it's the set of all bridgeless subgraphs that you want to sum over. And um, if you follow this construction through, you obtain the core of the algebra of graphs. And uh, Dirk invented this or generalized his uh, randomization of algebra in this sense in 2009. And of course, this uh, core of algebra is very related to the, to the normal randomization of algebra. And um, it's even the randomization of algebra of quantum gravity. So this is an example of a, of a co-product calculation in this algebra. So you can see that if you hit the wheel with three spokes with this data, then you get a formal sum of the graphs. And um, in each uh, tensor product summoned, you sort of end up with, um, with uh, respective pre prefactors giving you the number of these kind of graphs that appear there. All right, so, so the, the important thing now with the soft algebra is that using this construction, you can now you now have a group structure on these kind of linear maps from the graph to something else. So linear maps as this very simple phi map for the moduli space um, of curves or this more complicated tau map that I had before for out of n. 
And um, so, so under this map or under this, uh, this group of uh, uh, multiply, so, so you can multiply them, but they actually form a group under this multiplication. And uh, the interesting thing now is that this map phi, which is associated to the modular space of, um, of curves, and the map tau associated to out of n, are mutually inverse elements on the, under this group. So this uh, core Hopf algebra or this Hopf algebra of bridges graphs is it, it sort of dually relates this, these two characters. And um, this is sort of key to this implicit formula for, for our, our Euler characteristic. So in a way, this means that tau is the renormalized version of phi or as the respective counter term to phi. So we can write this down in a more physical way. So remember that uh, we can evaluate this, this strange linear combination of Euler characteristics um, for the modular space case via this uh, topological field theory here in the top on the right hand side. Um, so um, you can see that, so in the, so you integrate over an, exp uh, over an action or a functional sort of thing. It's just a one dimensional integral in, in essence, but you can interpret as, it as a quantum field theory. And the action is this one plus X minus E to the power of X up here. And you take the log of this whole thing to get the connected graphs. This gives you an explicit formula for the for the um, Euler characteristic of the modular space of the Alpine class groups. Um, but this duality between this phi and tau map implies that these uh, chi out of n terms they are encoded um, by the renormalization of the same topological field theory. So um, by, by randomization, I mean that, that you can set up an implicit um, uh, randomization condition, so to say, where you say that this topological field theory is supposed to vanish if we add certain counter terms. And these counter terms, they are just encoded by, um, by our um, numbers chi out of n. And this is the trick. And uh, this way you get this implicit asymptotic expansion for um, our numbers chi out of n. All right. Um, so, um, so this is it. So if there are any questions to, to this um, initial calculation, um, please ask them. Um, I will still briefly talk about um, some extensions of this work. So as a, an outlook, so what I talked about was just the rational Euler characteristic of um, of these of these groups, but you can, of course, also just look into the the naive Euler characteristic, which is just the normal alternating sum over the Betty numbers of the group. But um, this thing is much more harder, much harder to analyze than the rational Euler characteristic, because it does not have behave nicely under under um, isomorphisms or homomorphisms. And, um, but um, there's, a, there's a explicit formula for this, um, for this naive Euler characteristic, which is due to Kenneth Brown. Um, you can express it as a sum over um, on, your, uh, on, on finite order elements of, out, or of the initial group out of n in this case. And the normal, the, the rational Euler characteristics of the centralizers that correspond to these finite order elements. And um, so our investigation so far, they indicate very strongly that um, this, uh, this, um, uh, the, the quotient of this, oil, this naive Euler characteristic with um, the uh, rational Euler characteristic, it, it approaches a finite constant for n to infinity. So this would then automatically also prove that, um, that we have, um, that this indication of all this existence of uh, of homology in odd dimensions is actually there. So the the proof that would prove this existence of this um, homology. And uh, yeah, we didn't quite prove this yet, but we are almost there. So it's a, it's a bit technical to do this kind of stuff. Um, what this also leads to, and how it connects also to Francis' talk, 
is um, that uh, this is sort of all part of a bigger picture um, of these uh, graph complexes, of these Kontsevich graph complexes. So there's a trinity of graph complexes. There's a associative graph complex, the commutative graph complex, and the Lie graph complex. And I already indicated here in this table that the associative graph complex is of, sort of belongs to the world of um, modular spaces of curves. And um, it's so it's these, these very um, coarse invariants as the Euler characteristics. They have been studied by Haradagir already, or one can already associate them to it. Um, there's this commutative um, graph complex, which is quite uh, which is already a bit more mysterious. Uh, so the rational Euler characteristic of this is uh, really simple. It was written down by Konsevich in 93. And um, Wilbacher and Zivkovich, they uh, computed the integral Euler characteristic of some, up to some order. And this commutative graph complex is also the one that Francis talked about on Wednesday. And um, yeah, as you learned from there, so it has also very non complicated um, homological structures and it's kind of, kind of mysterious um, where this, the, the cycles come from in this, in this object. But there's another graph, graph complex, the Lie graph complex, um, which is sort of related to out of n in a sense. And um, you can calculate the rational Euler characteristic of this graph complex also with Konsevich methods. There's a bit of a different expression for it. But the integral Euler characteristic for this is unknown, or there's no formula for it. There's only some calculations by Morita, um, who used a supercomputer to calculate the uh, integer Euler characteristic up to order 11. Um, but um, recently, um, uh, I figured out a way uh, with, uh, with Karen, we figured out a way how to um, actually also write down a, a closed formula for this Euler characteristic, for this naive Euler integer Euler characteristic. So this is the formula. And um, so it's sort of explicit. It's an infinite dimensional integral over an infinite dimensional space. And um, so, so you can expand this and uh, actually calculate these numbers. And when I did this, uh, when I implemented this, this formula, I was able to get like uh, 14 coefficients out. And I was really happy because I got more coefficients out than, um, than the initial Morita calculation up to order 11. But then I showed this program to Jos Vermaseren and he uh, sent it back to me and it was much faster. And um, then it was uh, 40 coefficients. And, I and uh, yeah, just before the talk, Jos emailed me and told me that he found another trick to make the calculation faster. And now there are 70 coefficients of this integral Euler characteristic uh, known. So this is quite some progress there as well. And this is in preparation, so to say. Um, yeah, so um, this brings me to my uh, summary. So um, the short summary is that um, the Euler characteristic or the rational Euler characteristic of out of n is non-zero. And um, there are lots of open questions exactly on all this homology and where it comes from in this group. So it so this rational Euler characteristic itself, it indicates that there's much um, homology in odd dimensions but it's not known where this comes from. Um, so, and our investigations into the naive Euler characteristic, they support this totally. And, uh, but the question of course remains what generates this. Um, yeah, and so there's also other questions. So, so can, can one sort of um, explain this kind of weird duality between these two things? So there's, Already in the original um, paper there by Konsevich, he, he indicated that this is like a Kujul duality, but um, it would be interesting, I think, to try to understand this like on this very graphical level, on this, on this level of these Hopf algebras. And of course, yeah, one can also think about um, generalizing this to, um, to things like right angled Artin groups that, um, that Karen was talking about. Um, in her talk. All right. 
Um, so thank you. Um, I, I also would like to take the opportunity to also still thank those two people here in this picture for organizing this great conference. Um, so this is a rare sight of them from the front. So usually if you go hiking with them, you only see them from the back because they are so fast usually. So um, yeah, thanks you two, you are great uh, for organizing this great conference. All right, let's thank uh, Mishi for his great talk. <laughs> Are there questions? Um, yes, I have a question, if I'm allowed to ask. Absolutely. Um, you have explained that uh, Konsevich formulated his theorem um, by this formula where he sum over, takes the sum over graphs. And these graphs are ribbon graphs, right? Yeah. And later you formulate um, the renormalization, the Hopf renormalization, also with ribbon graphs or is it with other graphs? Uh, no, the trick there is that you can't forget about the ribbon graphs. Um, so this is sort of this uh, trick how this, um, this identity works there. So, uh, so you take this non-trivial linear combination to be able to forget about the ribbon graph structure. But you're right, so, so you go from, from ribbon graphs to connected graphs. Okay, because ribbon graphs and the other graphs have different automorphisms and uh, the groups are different, right? Or is it? Yeah, but uh, you can project down to graphs if you forget about, so, so there's an easy map from, from ribbon graphs to normal graphs by just forgetting about the orientation of the of the vertices. Okay. So if you just so so this is a nice function, and um, this expression up here on this left hand side, this just encodes sort of this this forgetful map, um, which forgets the individual orientation of the vertices. So this is part of the trick. And yeah, you're right. I, I, I skipped over this because, yeah, because of time. Okay. But yeah, you. so there's some subtlety there. That's true. All right. Well, other people are thinking of a question. I just can't resist to ask what does the beginning of the sequence for the integer Euler characteristic look like? Um, Okay. Um, yeah, it looks, I mean, I can, I don't know if I, hmm, I can, but it's, it's, a, it's a couple of numbers. I mean, it's not really, there's positive and negative ones. So it's not exclusively uh, negative or positive. And it also vanishes, I think, for a couple of initial numbers. Um, I don't know. I think I have some coefficients here. Yeah, I can send you the paper about the with the with the initial eleven numbers by Mobita, and I can also send you a list. But yeah, sorry, I didn't include them in the presentation. And like I right. said, Ross recently calculated seventy of them. I think yesterday. Francis has a question. All right, thank you. Um, forgive me if I've asked you this question before, but um, you had Tor and Phi that were inverses under the convolution uh, convolution product. So I wonder, and um, so you've got, um, so f say, say Tor to the power of one and Tor to the power of minus one, but you can also look at Tor to the power of n under the convolution. So right. Yeah. Have you, do you know, have an idea of what that might mean? Um, no. Sorry, no idea. Yeah, I think we, yeah. Yeah, I have to think about this. No, I don't, I, from, from the back of my head, I don't know anything um, about this uh, thing. Yeah, so maybe there's something that I, directly, I don't have any idea, sorry. I was wondering, since since you mentioned that you have a 
you have this picture with, with the phi and tau for the out of n and the, and the MGNs, the moduli spaces. So do you also have a way to do the commutative graph complex and its order characteristic? I mean, you, you, you mentioned the papers where people have computed this with other methods, but is there a way to formulate this in a similar way in, in your approach? Um, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, character in that case? Uh, the character would be, um, well, uh, yeah, so, yeah, actually, I mean, it would be the same one for the rational order characteristic It's the same one, because uh, it's surprisingly the associative and the rational, uh, the associative and the commutative uh, graph complex, they have the same order character, the same rational order characteristic, but this is kind of an accident. Um, so for the integral Euler characteristic, there you have to work more. And yeah, I, I uh, also, because Francis was talking about this, I already started to look into this and try to actually extend these methods, these new methods for the, for the integral Euler characteristic for the Lie graph complex to the computative graph complex to sort of get a similar expression that I showed in the back um, in, the, in the end of the talk. For um, for the commutative graph complex, but um, yes, I, I uh, wasn't able to do this now um, on the side of the conference. <laughs> sure. Uh, but yeah, I think it's totally possible. It should be actually not so hard, and it's just a question to get the science right eventually. So it's very just. Yeah. So it's uh, so this is sort of the challenge with these things to get get all the factors of two and signs and blah so, um, properly. So this is the, the challenge. And um, yeah, and also, I mean, this works by, you can interpret this as, as um, some, as doing some representation theory on graph. And um, yeah, so one can totally also do this for the commutative graph complex. And that, but there have already been different methods by, um, by Konsevich and Zivkovich. Who, who did this calculation, but they got sort of a different formula and they don't have any asymptotic results as far as I know. Thank you. Are there any final questions? Can I ask a question, Karen? Yes. So, Mishi, do you have any sort of easy way to explain the appearance of this strange asymptotics inverse square of log n? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I know where it comes from because um, this is how I calculated it. Um, it comes from uh, the, so the Lambert W function, mm -hmm. it has a singularity um, on the minus one branch. So um, okay. the Lambert W function, it has a branch cut. And if you go around the branch cut once and you go to the minus one branch, then you see a logarithmic singularity. And um, if you take then the first derivative of this singularity, you get a one over log singularity. So it's sort of a log to the power of minus one. And um, this is the type of singularity that pops up there. It's a pretty funny one. And um, it has this kind of, kind of okay. behavior for the coefficient. It's always X. that Lambert W sneaking up, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so it's, it, it's guilt by association because I, I remind people that Lambert W occurred in a paper by Dick and, and Karen when they made a toy model of uh, beta functions, and it, uh, it's the absolute of the essence of the uh, of the order of the summation that uh, Reimar talked about, and now you see it here in this context. It's uh, It's also in the stuff Gerald and Mishi did together. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, it, uh, I'd love to understand better. It, it's related to an idea of a video cost and called transasymptotics, where you where you resum these trans series in the other order. So you resum all orders of the instanton expansion for each order of the perturbative expansion, and that naturally leads to this um, lambda w because you're changing from exponentials to powers of the um, small parameter. So it's it's deeply buried in this uh, story. As we all know. All right. Well, let's thank Michi again.